Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ with the access that you've given us by your grace. I just ask that you would seal to our hearts all that which is truth. We're so grateful, so very grateful for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word. I ask your continued blessings upon this study and this ministry and the lives of those who are participating. We give you all the praise, all the glory and honor, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I'd like to start out here by reading a few verses that I've captured here, screenshots uh, of verses on my phone. I want to read through these and then I'd like to begin our next video in Romans. This is Romans 8.30. I know that's jumping ahead a little bit here in our present study. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. 2 Peter 3.18 But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Ephesians 2 6 And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1 3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Romans 8.32 He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? James 1.4 But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For who maketh thee to differ from another, and what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory, as if thou hadst not received it? 2 Peter 1, 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. In 2 Peter 1, 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I recently posted on my Facebook page, uh, name one spiritual blessing that you needed from God that you haven't received. Just one. Can't do it. Folks, I don't even know where to begin to describe the absolute um, amazing and profound truths that we've been presented so far, just so far in this study in Romans, and we're just getting up to chapter 7. We've got quite a ways to go. It just seems almost overwhelming in my mind. We've seen that we are totally depraved, that we're loved by God, we're given the, the gift of grace. We're made saints, called saints, that we have peace with God, that we've been justified, we've been made righteous. That's the righteousness of God in Christ. All of this based upon the obedience and the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, that we are children of promise, that we're blessed, that we're given hope, a sure standing in grace, access to God's grace. We're made to persevere, we're given character, we're, we're given deliverance, reconciliation with God. And now we've come to see in the sixth chapter how we've been identified with Christ in his death, 
burial and resurrection, that it wasn't just that Jesus died for us, but that we died with him, and all that that means, we're looking at that now. The reality of reckoning that was presented to us that's apart from faith, where we just don't call God a liar and we just agree with God that we have indeed died to sin, but we're alive unto God in Christ. And then the command to yield to either one, uh, we're going to yield to either one of our, our natures, if you want to call it that, the old man or the new man. And we're commanded not to yield to the old man in which the, in, in the flesh dwells no good thing, but the new man in which there is exists righteousness and peace and joy and and all of the qualities that, that com really comprise his life lived in us because we know that it's the life that is not I, but Christ. And I don't know how many Christians that I have met over the years, they don't feel totally depraved. They don't feel loved by God. They don't feel God's grace. They don't feel like a saint. They don't feel that peace that passes understanding. They don't feel righteous. They don't feel like he's faithful. They don't feel like they're very uh, obedient. They don't feel like they're God's child. They don't feel blessed or hopeful. They don't really know where they stand. They don't feel like they have access, that access to God's grace that he says we have. They don't know if they'll persevere they don't really see the character that, that they would like to in their lives. They don't feel assured about deliverance. They don't feel reconciled to God. And the list goes on and on. They don't know what identification with Christ is or what it means. They don't know what reckoning is or, or, or how vital an activity that is in the believer's life. They don't feel like they're yielding to God. And it saddens me. It saddens me deeply so much that I have devoted my entire life, what's left of it, here in this body to try and help Christians understand who they are in Christ and what he's did, what he's done, what Christ has done in the lives of his people. So... That's, I guess, somewhat of an introduction uh, to this next video in this series. In these videos, because James Daniel didn't learn it well, we'll be repeating chapters 1 through 6. Of course, I, uh, I hope you know I'm joking. Or perhaps we should go over a brief summary of what we have been shown up to the beginning of chapter 7. And I believe I've done that at least as, as best as I can, I've done that. You just heard me do that. And it, it almost leaves me speechless when I go through all that the, the, the Lord has shown us from Romans chapter 1 to Romans chapter 7. I'm just overwhelmed at the abundance of grace. And it's confusing, I know, as, as to why, even to myself, as, as to why so many pulpits are not teaching these truths. And it continues to this day to, be, to amaze me at just how far Christianity has drifted away from its spiritual mooring almost over the hill, over the horizon, out of sight of the lighthouse, where it's lost on a, on a sea of darkness and despair. The navigation, the navigational principles seem to be lost. It just seems to be a drift on a sea of unknowing, well, uncertainty uncertainty as to I'm talking specifically really about the individual lives of believers but but when when looked at from a corporate standpoint the corporate body of Christ the body of Christ as a whole 
it's important, I think, to understand that everything is going along just fine. Everything is intact. Everything, God is working in us, both the will and do of his good pleasure. He knows those that are his. It's primarily the world religious system that I've spoken about time and time again that you hear me talk about in almost every video. The world religious system, that system that's based upon human merit that I believe has gone so far astray from the truth that it almost borders on, if not is on, that word apostasy. Uh, I hardly know where to begin in this seventh chapter. I, I feel like, in a sense, that I, a real strong sense, I have a real strong sense that I never really did justice to chapter six because it was such an incredible chapter. But I think what we're going to find out is that as we move on, which I, I feel like at this point I'd like to do, I feel like that we're going to see just as, as amazing uh, as all that that has been in the past from chapters 1 through 6, we're going to see chapter 7 to be just as amazing as all the rest. It just, the grace doesn't end. It doesn't stop. So we're going to, I decided to go ahead and move into chapter 7. Uh, I guess this would be Romans part 41. And so uh, it's, I guess the, the, the best way I could begin the, uh, and it's some kind of introduction in, to Romans chapter 7 is just to say that most of the Bible teaching I've heard over the years has been humanly centered. You know, it's been about what we ought to do, what we should do, what we shouldn't do, what we can do, and, and on and on and on it goes. Our responsibilities, our efforts, our worship, our diligence, our surrender, but very, very little about how wonderful and how great and how majestic is our God. The Lord Jesus Christ declared that the scriptures testify of him. Not a testimony of some map for your life, but of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And now we come to Romans chapter 7, a, ch a chapter that many people like to, to, to miss. Uh, many Christians are not real fond of. I'm not suggesting at all that I think this is a difficult chapter, but many do. As we begin to look at the seventh chapter, there are three ways, three primary ways. Now, there's many others but three primary ways that Bible teachers handle the, the seventh chapter of Romans. Now, the most popular is that the seventh chapter of Romans shows Paul in a defeated Christian experience. And the eighth chapter shows him victorious. And that's probably, at least in, in my experience, that's, that's that's been the, the most common uh, interpretation, the most common suggested by German theologians years ago. And it seems to be a very popular position among Christians. The second position that is taken many times is that the seventh chapter of Romans, well, it's a picture of Israel before the cross. And the third position, which is the one I'm going to suggest, and I will continue to point out that, that I'm no oracle of truth and that your responsibility is to search the scriptures daily 
to see whether or not these things be so. I believe the seventh chapter of Romans to be a beautiful chapter because, because it portrays the conflict that every single one of you know. Some of you intently, some of you just beginning to know it, but I guarantee that you'll all know it. And that's the conflict between the old man and the new man. It's a, it's a conflict that won't end until we have been removed from this body of death. It will continue on and on until we go and meet the Lord, until we stand in front of him. We have a marvelous treasure, but our treasure is in an earthen vessel. And, and I don't see how that we can not see the logical procession of truth presented in this epistle, given what we have seen up to this point, where we are now being introduced to that struggle. Wouldn't have made any sense for us to be introduced to it before this point. We've, we've just been told that we are to yield ourselves unto God as those who have risen from the dead with Christ to walk in newness of life, his life, and that can only be speaking of the righteous, sinless new man. So, at least as I, I see it, it's only logical that the Holy Spirit would bring us to this point. So we are looking at the conflict between what many Bible teachers call the old nature and the new nature. I, I think I mentioned this, I pointed this out before. I actually prefer to call them the old man and the new man because, well, that's the language that I see that, that the Holy Spirit uses. I believe very strongly that the seventh chapter of Romans is a picture of the conflict between flesh and spirit, old man and new man, the unchangeable old man, the unchangeable new man. Now, there are several basic principles that we have to think about. I know this is a poor illustration. I really hate making up physical illustrations because I don't think that they're, you know, ever all that great. But if I were not only the, the president, but the CEO and, and the, the monarch and the dictator of the largest ranch in Oklahoma, and I decide what Matt, you know, over here, one of my ranch hands, you know, I decide he's doing a, 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 fa a fabulous job. So I'm going to give him a raise. As far as I'm concerned, uh, he has the raise. You know, it'll go into the to the corporate accounting. It'll change the books. It'll it'll change our payrolls totals, uh, our withholdings, and and, and and everything else. He doesn't have it yet. He doesn't have the, the money yet. I've been busy. Uh, I've, I've had to, me, I've had to ride out to Cowskin Creek and about 40 miles, you know, up, up river here and check on some uh, lazy cowboys that aren't making much progress on some new fencing. And, you know, I, may, I might decide to stay on as foreman, you know, for a while since I, you know, fired my, you know, since I, I sent the old foreman looking for another job. You know, it's going to be a while before I get back and before I get back and tell the accounting department that, you know, they ought to pay this guy. But he has the raise. Now, it's going to make a big difference to him when he gets the money. Doesn't, doesn't make any difference to me. in one sense of the word, and, and that's why we get 
into the problem of how much we spiritualize the Word of God and how much we don't. Folks, God is timeless. I believe that with all of my heart. But God accommodates himself to time. God uses the past tense. God uses the present tense. God uses the future tense. I do not believe that, strictly speaking, there's any future with God or that there's any past. It seems to me the best way to look at God and eternity is, and I've mentioned this before, timelessness. God lives in timelessness, but he accommodates himself to time. Now, in God's economy, it was done at the cross. You know, for example, the Lord Jesus Christ says, not one jot nor tittle will pass away until all be fulfilled. And then he goes on and he goes on and he says that he fulfills the law. Now, I believe Christ fulfilled the law. He did that. And not one jot or tittle of it passed away until he fulfilled it. But the law was added until. I didn't use those words. The Holy Spirit did. What then serveth the law? It was added until. It was added until. If it was added, it can be subtracted. There must be something in the until. We know that he took the ordinances that were against us and he fastened them to his cross. Nailed them to his tree. I don't see any problem with the, with the illustration in Romans 7 that, that Paul is giving. And we died to the law. And, and it isn't that, that the law was done away with. It was fulfilled in Christ. It's that, it's that the ordinances of the law that were against us don't exist anymore in Christ because we have Christ who is the fulfillment of the law. They were taken care of in the cross. Or by the cross. So I could, I could stand back and I could say in one sense of the word, at the cross, if God's going to accommodate himself to time, everything's done. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. New creation. Now, people come to me and, and they say, well, we never could have been dead in sin. I mean, God did this all in Christ. Aren't we in Christ chosen before the foundation of the world? Yes, we were. I, I don't have any problem with that. I believe God clearly declares without any, with, with no, without question, he declares that before the foundation of the world, we were chosen in Christ. I believe the cross of Christ was programmed by God before he ever created the heavens and the earth. Now, whether, whether the text is there in Revelation or not is up to you. You'll have to become a Greek scholar on that, but he was crucified before the foundation of the world. He shed his blood before the foundation of the world. Two thousand years ago, roughly, uh, you know, give or take a few years. So, and so there's a sense in which God made executive decisions. The sovereign, majestic God ruled covenanted, and, and, and I believe it's done. Then we read in the word, and you being dead in your trespasses and sin, wait a minute, 
the cross was 2,000 years ago. Was I dead in sin 2,000 years ago? In a sense, yes, but if we accommodate it to time, there was a time when you didn't know what God had done for you in Christ. I didn't know what God had done for me in Christ. There was that time. Some find that out at a very early age. Paul didn't find it out until, you know, he was over 50. Now, I believe clearly the scriptures declare that God had separated Paul from his mother's womb. Paul was God's. He belonged to God. Paul was God's child. But in God's economy, there are certain things that he has decreed. You were dead in sin. You were made alive in Christ. In one sense of the word, you can email me and say, didn't that all happen 2,000 years ago? And I can reply back and say, not only that, I think it happened before the foundation of the world. But it also happened at a point in time in your life. If I look back, folks, if I look back at, at the, the grand scheme, it seems to fit a model to me that God put Adam in the Garden of Eden, and when he fell, all sinned, and as a result of that sin, all died. Death passed upon all men. Now, I simply have God's word for that. I don't have any great scientific insight, but God declares that when Adam sinned, all sinned, and that because of Adam's sin. And that because of Adam's sin, not Satan's, but of Adam's sin, death passed upon the world system. Some people can argue that there wasn't any death before Adam sinned. And that, and that is, I believe that's absolutely correct. In the world system, I don't, I don't know, uh, I don't know what there was someplace else. But in the world system, there was no death until Adam sinned, because that's what the word clearly states. And then death passed upon all men. It is difficult for me. It may not be for you, and, and apparently it isn't for a lot of people who seem to get mad at me. Please, I, I, I've said this before. You know, you, you folks, you can't make me mad. I'll probably make you mad, but you'll never make me mad. I love this book, and I love the Lord, and I, and I, I love you people. And if you have a weird idea of what of what this or that verse means, well, that's fine. I, I love you dearly. Now, I may disagree with you violently, but I love you dearly. It's difficult for me to understand how anything can die that isn't alive. Something had to be alive in order to die. It has to first be alive. I was alive before Adam sinned. Death passed upon all men. There must have been all men life. So I was alive and I died in Adam and I was made alive in Christ. I can then with Paul say I was alive once apart from the law that God removed the results of Adam's transgression for all men. So I was alive. I died in Adam, and God removed that, that transgression. When was I then dead in trespasses and sins? When I sinned. And that's and that's what this chapter right here, the seventh chapter, is going to say. I was alive apart from the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. 
Now that's got to be the second time that Paul died, that he died. Or I don't understand this book, because this book tells me that he died in Adam. Now he's telling me when sin revived, he died. I've, I've covered this before, how that, you know, this is why I believe all children go to heaven. What? I mean, did Adam sin again? No, it has to be sin in Paul's life. The transgression was removed in Christ. In your experience, because you have no, rec you have no recollection of having died in Adam or of having been made alive in Christ, for that matter, when he died in the first century A.D., there came a time in your life, folks, when sin revived and you died. Now, well, now you need to be born again or born from above. And that birth has to be done by your parents, not you. And so you're born by God, John 1.13, born by the will of God. I was alive apart from the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. What does he need to do? He needs to be born again. He needs to be born again. And the problem with modern evangelism is they suggest that that is left up to you. And folks, birth is never left up to the baby. Never. And that's what God did for us in Christ. Now, all of a sudden, realizing what God has done for us in Christ, where we, we come to see that we have been made the, the very righteousness of God in Christ, we discover that there's a real, very real conflict occurring between the flesh and the spirit. A conflict that doesn't exist in in the person who does not know God, who doesn't hasn't been made a new creation. The old man and the new man, even after we have obeyed the commandment to reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ, even after we have come to yield ourselves unto God as alive unto God, unto him which is the natural response of the new man, the old man is not yielding himself to God as alive from the dead. All because he did not eradicate the old man, which God could have easily done. He could have easily done that. Except to do so, would have been jumping the gun just just a bit if if I guess that's the best way I could put it. We are simply not ready for the final redemption of our bodies yet. Listen to me, folks. You reach the point in your life where where that there is no more sin. You don't need Christ. I did it. You know, I did it. None of you guys did it, but I finally did it. I've, you know. I've reached this level of, you know, I've talked to uh, hundreds of Christians, you know, what a marvelous change in my life. And a week later, they can't, they can't believe it. Sin's still there. Uh, did they expect it not to be? The old man didn't disappear. You know, Steve, what am I going to do? You know, I can't stop doing this and I can't stop doing that. What am I doing wrong? What do you need to know? Folks, you need to know that the dominion of that old man that was there before has been annulled. Katergao, Katergao, or Gao, been annulled. Not annihilated, but annulled. Sin shall not have dominion over you. And you could read the testimony of hundreds, hundreds of old men who are alarmed 
at how alive the old man appears to be. I mean, it's one thing to be tempted when you're young because you you know you can do it. It's another to be tempted when you're old where you couldn't do it anyway. Okay, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but it doesn't get any better, folks. It doesn't get any better. The old man becomes more and more corrupt by the day. Thank God that you don't live to be 203. You hate sin now. What modern Christianity teaches about the seventh chapter of Romans is that you fight this in your life until there's no more sin. Or at least you try to. And I say baloney. When you reach the point where in your life there is no more sin, you don't need Christ. Oh, I did it. None of you guys did it, but man, I finally did it. And folks, I don't believe God's going to let that happen. Well, I, I'll be as bold as to say I know God's not going to let that happen. It's Paul as an old man who makes two statements that we need to learn. I see that it in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God it's Jesus Christ, not me. And modern Christianity would suggest that's you. It isn't you. It's Christ. The text says, shows Paul thanking Christ, not himself. If we weren't in this conflict, we wouldn't understand grace. We wouldn't understand God's love. We wouldn't understand the miracle of birth from above. We wouldn't understand a lot of stuff. All we'd do is be proud that we did it. This is my introduction to this chapter. We need that conflict. Dearly beloved, we need that conflict. It's not something to look upon in, in dread. To understand what God has done for us. Now the illustration starts out in the seventh chapter with a man and his wife. And we'll pick up there next time. I love you all. I truly do. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again for the opportunity you've given us to feast upon your word. We just thank you for who you are and all that you are in our lives. Filter out any foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth and only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.